Welcome to the podcast, Life After Addiction and Indictment. I'm your host, Steve Cloward, and I spent most of the last decade and well over $100,000 on coaches, consultants, masterminds, and events trying to figure out how to reclaim my life again. On this podcast, I'm going to share the tools, the tips, the tricks, and the hacks that allowed me to forgive myself so that I could reclaim my life again. I'll be interviewing experts in mindset, leadership, entrepreneurship, sales, marketing, branding, and so much more. I'm glad you're here. Sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Let's go. This is Life After Addiction and Indictment. Hey, welcome to Life After Addiction and Indictment. Today, I've got a, a gentleman that's joining us that uh, has got a story that we're going to talk talk about and uh, you know learn how to go through difficult times in life, addiction, etc., and you know, what it takes to win and be successful. Um, I I just met this gentleman today. His wife actually is who I go to now to get my hair cut. And when we were talking a few months back, uh, you know, as I discussed kind of a little bit about my podcast, you know, she mentioned her husband. And so I'm excited to have uh, Chris Neville here today. So how are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate you taking the time out to do this. I know you said you hadn't haven't done a podcast before, and and uh, so thanks for doing this and this being your first one. I appreciate you having me on. You betcha. Well, typically, what I like to do is just kind of have you give a little bit of background of you know kind of maybe how you grew up, um, you know when you started doing drugs, alcohol, you know whatever, <laughs> and kind of go through that point and and. Uh, Give us a little back history there, and then we'll kind of go from there. How's that sound? That sounds great. Um, well, for me, I don't know if you call it early, but I started smoking weed when I was 11. Uh, wow. Running around skateboarding with my kid, my friends. Uh, I, I can picture the moment in my, my head. Like, really? I can see the whole thing like it happened yesterday. Um, Where did you grow I mean, up? What's city and state? <clears throat> I grew up around in Folsom, so around Sacramento. Okay. Uh, okay. Folsom Prison Blues. Like, I drove past that prison every day of my life. Oh, so, wow. Um, and then I grew up around Lake Tahoe, so is where my, my grandparents are from. Okay. Um, so I guess, I mean, I guess you can consider that pretty early. That's pretty early. Um, <laughs> and then from there, like, I just remember, like, I started getting drugged to, AA meetings when I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old. Oh, really? And just, yeah, listening to people's stories. And so uh, I don't participate now. And it works for people. That's great. But, right. you know, like I just, I remember being in basements in downtown Sacramento and then going to these parties where, yeah, they weren't drinking. <laughs> they were sure doing a lot of Coke in the bathroom. <laughs> oh wow who was dragging yeah. you to the meetings were you were going with parents or so so no so um i was raised mostly by my grandparents okay and you know they're they raised their kids and so if either my mom and stepdad or my grandparents couldn't take me then i would get put with one of my aunts and uncles usually my aunt and she's uh she's one of those people who can't stay sober without AA. Uh -huh. um, so I, I got drugged to meetings, you know, at a super young age. So, I mean, I, I've always been around drugs and alcohol, like my whole life. When I was a teenager, like there was always a block party happening and it was kind of encouraged for you to give up your keys so you can get, you know, fucked up with everybody. Yeah. And then, you know, you sneak off with the group here, you sneak off with the group there. Everybody's doing something different. Uh -huh. So, Jeez. Um, I mean, that's kind of how it started for me, I guess. And then when it kind of blew out of proportion, I guess, would be in 2003, uh, I was in a car that broke down where I-5 and Hi Highway 50 in downtown Sacramento merged together. And the car was sitting in like that merge triangle and 
Uh-huh. Somebody went to go around everybody that was slowing down and just slammed into the back of us going 70 miles an hour. Oh, shit. And then so I got hooked up with a doctor that ultimately went to prison for over prescribing medication. Wow. I mean, I would leave his house with some or leave his, his office. So he would leave his office with your prescription. And I would leave with, I don't know, three, 400 pills a week. Jeez. And like not small, like 10 milligram Norco, Soma, Valium, like just bags. <laughs> wow. You know, and then from there, it just kind of, it, it just morphed into where I was living in Washington eventually. Uh, I mean, I was homeless um, in Sacramento. I wound up in Washington where my drug of choice is, uh, is pills. Um, yeah. Any kind of opiates. Yeah. Opiates. Okay. Opiates. Yeah. Um, my bag's oxycodone, but like I met chemists who were making fentanyl in, you know, 2008. Jeez. So I was like buying bags of fentanyl powder. Uh, I found people with fentanyl patches. So I would wear like, 300 micrograms of fentanyl for three days at a time uh-huh gee um and then kind of then then it turned into i had a pain management doctor in seattle when i would leave seattle i would stop this is during a time of paper charts not medical or electronic yeah. medical <laughs> records right so i knew i could go to my pain management doctor yeah. and get my script from her and then stop at like six more doctor's offices, walk-in clinics, whatever, get to the house, yeah. go to <laughs> six different pharmacies and fill them all. I mean, I had guys dropping off oxycodone or oxycotton, 80 milligram oxycotons, mm-hmm. scraping off the, the coating and chewing them up, like just out of control. I, I came close to overdosing twice. I got woke up. One time was on Thanksgiving at my boss's house. Like I went to go take a nap and was, I'd taken three Oxycontins, 80 milligram Oxycontins and went to go take a nap in his den and like just about didn't wake up. Wow. How so long- then ultimately, <laughs> that, what's that? What's how, that? Long, how long did this last that you were, you know, doing a lot? Oh, this is a decade at least. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good, no, it was, so uh, I ended up in prison in 2011 for robin pharmacies no kidding so it got to that Um, point yeah oh yeah absolutely like yeah it was so out of control and i like i remember having any narcotics one morning and same thing like i can see it like the first time i smoked weed like i was literally like physically going insane or like just out of my mind because like i had no way you know what i mean Oh, yeah. I just went and got in my car. I, I so I've been I've done construction my whole life, and I was I had built a pharmacy for a you know a new pharmacy. Oh, and wow. while I was doing while I was doing, I was like, hey, when's your uh, security guy gonna come in here and put your alarms in? It's like, there's no alarm. Wow. And uh, I was like, what? And he goes, yeah. If somebody comes in and says they want this, we give it to them, and then we call the police. And I was like, Ooh, light bulb. Yep. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, yeah, walked in, handed him a note, left with the stuff, and then did it about five more times. And the same pharmacy or different? <clears throat> no, I just kept coming back to the same one. I was yeah. like, I, it, I know that that sounds like really dumb, but I was almost no, to the no, when you're no, you're a dick. If <laughs> I didn't get caught, I mean, I knew, I knew where it was, I knew the routes, I knew, um. It was just convenient. Right. And then I, I knew like deep down that honestly, it was my only way out. Right. You know, because <clears throat> I don't know, like nobody ever, every, like my family just kind of ignored it with me. Uh-huh. With my aunt, it's like, oh, she relapsed, rush her off to rehab and all this and that, you know, and it's like, oh, that's just Christ. Yeah. yeah right on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. So when you would go in and, and rob them, you'd hand them a note. Did you have any disguise on or anything, or you just go in and hand them a note? Yeah. I, I, yeah. No, I was Washington. So it's always kind of, 
misty and crappy outside. So yep. I would put a hoodie on, put a hat on, probably sunglasses, and yeah. uh, what you wouldn't even what you would find out a place in a pharmacy, a doctor's mask, or you know, like a COVID mask. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, just walk in and like just hand them the note, walk out. They ended up saying that uh, I did three years for it. Uh-huh. And it's because they said, one of them said I had a gun. Really? And it's not on. And so then it becomes my burden to prove I didn't have a gun. Yep. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so, but I mean, honestly, like it saved my life. It, exactly. It got me clean, it got me sober the first time. Mm-hmm. And then fast forward, get out of prison, everything's going great. Amanda and I reconnected. We had a house in Washington and I threw my, I got out of bed one day and it just fell straight to the floor and my, uh, my back was all pitched up. So she told me we're going to the hospital. I said, no. And then it happened again that night. She said, we're going to the hospital. And I was like, okay. And they gave me a 90, you know, 90 oxycodones. Here you go. Yep. Even after I told him my path, Yep. <laughs> and then and then a week later I was in back surgery and they hit me with fentanyl. And I was literally just immediately, hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> yep. And Jeez. and then away I went for I mean it didn't get bad. Um it was bad. I was doing fucking drugs, but right. I had a doctor, so then we moved to Utah and I get hooked up with this doctor we had the military in common and he was writing me a script for you know vicodin every two weeks and i'd play my games and get them early and then I'd play my <laughs> games and i don't even want to say what i did with the prescriptions but <laughs> i wasn't i was filling them early i can tell you that yep <laughs> and uh, you even if it had a date on it like i'd, I'd fill it early i'd find a way and I did that for a few years, and then Amanda and I were driving to, uh, I mean, it almost, it probably is probably the only thing that's ever come close to ending my marriage. We yeah. went up to Salt Lake City to buy something, and we were on our way back, and I'd been chewing on it for a few weeks, and I was like, look, I, you know, you want to know what's wrong? This is what's wrong. Yeah. And then since then, oh, well, no, I can't say it since then. So then I decided to try Adderall. Okay. A couple of years ago. And I was like, oh, I could deal with uppers. Nope. <laughs> Can't deal with so that I'm t- I ate 40 Adderall in two days. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. And like big one, like the 20 or the whatever the biggest ones you can get. I don't know if they're 20 or 30. Huh. But yeah, just so like I'm a kind of a zero to go as fast as we can go. <laughs> right. So kind how of long- addict. Yeah, that's fairly typical. Um, so how long tell, or what was the situation, you know, that got you to stop the Adderall and finally get clean and decide that it was time to just leave all that stuff behind? I just kind of got fed up with it. And I've gotten to a point in my life where, and I've been going to therapy and kind of working through my shit. Yeah. I was like, okay, here's a problem. And it lasted, the Adderall lasted for about six months. You know, I was taking Amanda's Adderall. Uh-huh. I, you know, like I was fucking around all kinds of stuff with that. And then I just got fed up with it. And I was like, you know what? This is, this is, you're just going to destroy your life again. And I just looked around and I was like, I had gratitude for what I have received in life, given my, what I've been through in life. And I just decided I put it down and I haven't touched it since. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's uh, not easy to do, but like you say, when you really look and evaluate, you know, the fact that you were able to do that, then you just realize that you're you know, not living the life that you want to live. And No, exactly. And I, I, I kind of got fed up also because, so when you get out of prison, and you Google what kind of jobs can a felon get, right? Because <laughs> right. I got tired. I, I've been doing construction since I was 12 years old. Uh-huh. It, so in my family, you either we went to college 
or you went to work for my my grandfather my dad and um it was decided at a very young age i remember the day it was christmas eve 1989 is the day i started doing construction and wow he and his office were upstairs having a christmas party and i was downstairs putting wedge anchors together um and i mean so then after that like I don't mean like, oh, I, you know, like I helped my grandpa out on the weekend. No, I worked 40 hours a week from the time I was 12 years old. Wow. <clears throat> and that's all I really know. But I got fed up with construction around 2016 when we opened the barber shop, actually. Uh-huh. And, and I started kind of Googling, like, what kind of jobs can I get outside of construction? And it's like, oh, you can go be a package handler at UPS. Are you tired of paying exorbitant monthly fees for your in-home entertainment? Do you wish there was a way to bring quality and affordable entertainment right into your household without a monthly subscription? Well, look no further. Introducing the VC Box Android TV Stream Box. Since 2020, VC Box has been enriching people's lives all over the world, and now it's coming to North America. Say goodbye to scattered subscriptions and countless apps. We've got all your streaming in one place. This is the best fully loaded Android TV box provider in North America. Our user-friendly interface makes navigation a breeze, and with the voice remote featuring Google Assistant, finding your entertainment has never been easier. The VC Box V2 Pro Android box is the epitome of convenience. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your favorite shows and movies with just a few simple voice commands. And the best part, no monthly subscriptions. That's right, you heard it correctly. Say goodbye to those pesky recurring fees and hello to endless entertainment. Join the VC Box revolution and elevate your entertainment experience. Don't miss out on this amazing opportunity. Visit our website and order your VC Box now. Bring home the VC Box today and bring endless joy and excitement to your household. VC Box, unleash the power of entertainment. And that's just so uh, my father in law changed the way I think a lot. And I was like, you know what? That's unacceptable for me. Yeah. And so I went out and I've been running the barbershop, the business portion of it since 2017. And I went out and I became a superintendent because I'm like, well, I know construction. Let's try the management side of it. Yeah. So I went and worked for Leighton Construction as as an assistant superintendent and worked on a hospital. Um, And then that was actually kind of when I was back in my Vicodin time again, my relapse with Uh Vicodin. And I ended up losing that job. And it was, I told the superintendent was training me. He had a very disrespectful way of talking to people. Uh And... I like it. It makes me very, my brain to mouth filter is off. Yep. <laughs> and he said something to somebody one day and I said, what the fuck did you just say to him? And I laid into him and that was kind of the beginning of the end of that job. And then I was sitting around, I applied for a job up at Hammerton Lighting in Salt Lake City. And um, I waited around for four months because it was when the economy started to slow down. Yeah. And he called me one he called me one day and he said, Hey, you know, we're just not gonna be able to hire you for this position. It was a plant manager position for this plant and the one in Mexico. And I was like, No worries, thanks for calling. And I, I literally picked up the phone and I called another one of my wife's clients who gave her gave her his phone number and told her to told me to call him. And I just uh-huh. picked up the phone and called him, went back to work as a superintendent again for a construction company up in Park City building custom homes. And then six yeah. months to the day later, I got promoted to uh, director of operations. Yeah, that's not too bad. And that's that's currently what you're doing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, you know, those listening, if you're not familiar with Park City and what a custom home is in Park City, you know, this is <laughs> as high end as you can, I mean, you might as well compare it to Hollywood. I mean, it's the highest end of stuff you can do. So, it's, yeah, you know, you're not uh, uh, just doing, you know, working for some little outfit that's doing track homes. This is a big time deal. <clears throat> no, yeah, these are, I mean, they're one of them is $25 million. Yeah. So these are, <laughs> these are big houses with a lot of detail and very specific clients. Yeah. And uh, 
sometimes probably very high maintenance type clients. You got to know how to deal with people. And also imagine you've got a lot of subs and or even employees that you're dealing with as well. So you're over a lot of different people plus dealing with the actual client, I would assume at times. Oh, a hundred percent. And yeah, it's uh, no comment on the high maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Experience some of that. I get it. <laughs> but uh, uh, they, they want what they want. And that's, that's right. It. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, so, but no, I, so for the, I mean, but for the first time in my life, I actually love my job. Yeah. And that makes such a big difference. Don't you think as far as the overall picture as an addict, it's one thing, it's difficult to deal with that. And, and like you mentioned, you know, therapy or whatever as addicts, you know, or alcoholics, it doesn't matter what at you're addicted to sex, porn, eating, exercise, you know, until you deal with what the underlying issue is, that's causing you to continue to do what you're doing. Cause it's something else. It's not just because you want to do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, totally. Once you deal with that, then you have a chance. But then if you start doing something career wise, job wise, whatever that you enjoy, that's, that's a total game changer to make it that much easier also to stay on course, you know, because we're usually just 100%. coming ourselves out with the things that we're abusing, you know, from, unhappiness or what avoidance of pain or whatever you know so that's pretty cool i mean i just thought it was normal yeah oh yeah in the beginning you know like i mean my other bag like there was a point in my life where i was drinking a fifth of whiskey and a fifth of tequila every night wow but like that was kind of just normal my whole life um you know it was no big deal like I, I mean, I guess like my mom and stepdad maybe weren't that much like they were drinking it. So it's not every day, but my grandfather was a uh, he. You know, he he drank like that every day, Jeez. and so like I just like people like even I mean I don't obviously don't drink or do anything now, and it's sometimes you look at it and you think, well it's almost become normal in society to go out and get fucked up every day. Yeah. Like to deal with your life, like exactly like you said, you know, like I just, I don't, I just don't try to numb it away now. I deal with it head on, whether that's through therapy or meditation or whatever the outlet is. Yeah. Yeah that's what it takes you know you life's tough enough but you know if you got stuff coming at you that is it's really causing you a lot of stress or anxiety or whatever you've got to figure out how to cope with it the the funny part is i'm under oh i'm under more stress now than i ever have been in my life (laughs) yeah it's just a matter of dealing with it is it and it's a different stress it's not that a lot of stress from addiction, I think, comes from the belief that we're not good enough. Bingo. Um, but work stress or life stress, it's just a different stress. Yeah. You could deal with it. You don't know how to, if you don't go, honestly, if you don't, what I found, I figured out for myself anyway, is without therapy and working out that I'm not good enough for the, I mean, I, yeah, I would probably still just be relapsed. And yeah, I, I can't I agree. say I'm not addicted to anything now as I sit here and hit my babe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, but it's also, you know, I'm also not saying there was a point in my life where I was probably, I was probably taking four 30 milligram oxycodone, four 60 milligram extended release morphine shoot up. Like, I don't know, six, seven times a day. Yeah. It's like that's what you that's what your life revolves around. Oh yeah. And yeah, most people can't even comprehend that because that would kill most people. But if you continue to do it and do it, you just put in you and not die. Yeah. But, but uh don't yeah, it's in, one yeah. time that's a little too much and it's over, you know. Oh, 100 percent hundred percent. Uh I'm lucky. I'm, you know, I'm lucky that I never killed somebody driving or, you know, just really 
I'm sure I hurt plenty of people emotionally or mm -hmm. along the way, but nothing. I, I'm sure plenty of bad things did happen as a consequence of my drug use, but right. I feel like three years in prison was a pretty, <laughs> pretty light punishment for the bullshit that I created for, you know, 15 years. Yeah. Cause this started for me and well, real addiction started for me in 2003 and then, I guess it was less than 10 years. So I went to prison in 2011. Wow. Was that was it a state situation or a federal? Yeah, it was. It was in Washington. Gotcha. Um, and that'll sure give you a, a different respect for life. Jeez, can imagine it's ironic. Actually, that's where I got actually got sober. Was in Seattle. Did rapid. Oh detox. really? Yeah, I did rapid detox in Seattle, in July okay. two thousand. Yeah, that was crazy, but. Uh, so you're now you're, you know, got a great career. You've got respect. You obviously have worked through some stuff and learned that you are good enough. And I think, like I said, to me, that's one of the biggest keys. I think just if, you know, if you have that belief or a lot of guilt and shame, like that's something that so many people experience. And it's so important to get help with that because you're just telling yourself lies, you know, and it's so easy. to oh, go. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's not to say I don't slip into that occasionally. Oh yeah, I mean, especially in my, especially in my position. I mean, I'm in charge of millions and millions and millions of dollars, and it's overwhelming. I have to keep track of up to. I mean, if by the end of spring or by the sorry, by the start of winter, we'll be up around twenty jobs, 20 and that's jobs. twenty that's budgets. Huge. That's 20 budgets over $10 million that I'm responsible for. Wow. And that that's not if I let it, I can overwhelm you. It's something that I'm it's it's something that I work on every other week with my therapist. Wow. Is keeping that thought out of my head. And what happens when that thought creeps in? And how quickly can I let it dissipate? You know, because yeah, I, I'll go down that road a hundred percent. No doubt. Like, yes. oh my God, I do not belong in this chair. Like, <laughs> why are you like, I'll, I'll look around and be like, why are you sitting here? <laughs> well, it's crazy because it's so easy to think that way, but yet the opposite is you obviously are good at something that somebody saw in you to put you in that chair, you know? So that's kind of a funny circumstance, actually, because I was a superintendent for this company and I didn't have a project to run. So I was kind of helping around with the uh, other pro um, operations manager and, or director. And I knew his job was coming up because he was moving on to a different company. And I went on the website and applied. I'm like, I have, you know, I'm as deserving as anybody else, right? I've, I own, run a business. I know how to do it. Yeah. And my boss came to me one day and he goes, I thought you filled out an application. And he kind of made, it was kind of a joke, right? He's like, you thought I was kidding. <laughs> and I was like, hey, do me a favor. Just take me seriously. And then lo and behold, so we're fast forward two months. We're at this company gathering and he, he's talking about people with some people in the company. And he gets to me and he goes, Chris, Chris surprised me. 25 people applied for that position. He said, I couldn't interview 25 of them. Or he said 26 people. I was 26. Uh -huh. The 25 people I couldn't even interview because the test scores weren't fair. Jeez. <laughs> they said, he said, he, he said, he said, Chris tested so far above every other candidate that it wasn't even worth. It wasn't, it wasn't fair. <laughs> wow. So I don't know what I did on that. Test. So we have to take a, so you send in your resume uh -huh. and if it kind of matches up what they're looking for, you move to the next step, which is a personality assessment and a skills assessment. It takes about two and a half hours to complete. Uh -huh. And then, and then if you make it through that, then you get the video interview, which is super weird. And then, uh, then eventually if 
anybody other than me would have brought in for an interview, but I skipped that step. <laughs> Gosh. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, and I, I, guess, I mean, the other thing that I kind of started, and I was actually I'm talking to one of my employees about this right now, is because he's struggling with some stuff. Um, and he hasn't, you know, he gets some trouble with addiction from his past and he's trying to better his life. He's a superintendent and he kind of came to a crossroads last week where life was tapping him on the shoulder saying, Hey, we had two write-ups for him. Uh-huh. And it's like, I told him straight up. I was like, look, bro, you got to decide for you what you want to do, but you're going to get a few taps on your shoulder from life. This is one of them. You get to decide. I said, and he started talking about that record we play of I'm not good enough. <laughs> yeah. I said, you got to, I said, I don't know if you got to find a therapist. I don't, if you need to talk to me, whatever, but you got to stop playing that record because you made it this far. And uh, I said, but now it's, you know, you're either going to end your life or you're not. I said, I made a choice for myself because I was you two years ago. And I made a choice to answer life's call. And uh, I said, this is, you know, where I've made it to in a very, in six months, in seven months, it's easy to get to here. And uh, he's, you know, so he's, he actually decided to take life's call. He was in my office doing some studying and learning. And I, I would say that's probably been my biggest ally is books, learning, yeah. therapy, meditation, and just expanding on my knowledge. So that I can't even play that record anymore of I'm not good enough because all evidence points the other direction. (laughs) Yeah, it's crazy because, you know, it's so easy not to take that look the other direction, you know, and just grab onto the stories that you've got and the thoughts that come in and Uh, make them so much worse. You know, it's just, it's interesting as, as I think the human race, you know, for some reason that's, seems to be the conditioning, but yet it's kind of like, you know, realizing you have a problem with drugs, you know, until you realize something and understand what's going on, you really don't understand there's a different way, you know, and that there is help and things that can, you know, improve things. And, and so as those, like you say, when those thoughts and that all the garbage that basically you start listening to happens, real you know recognize yeah. it's the key then you can also then you can turn turn it around and take a look at the things i mean one of the things you said early on that i felt was is one of the key things for anybody i believe is just being more grateful you know it's so easy mm-hmm. to just go through life and be a victim and complain about the, the the things that aren't going right but if you'll look you always have something to be grateful for 100 100 percent. i mean I just look around at my kids, my you know, my Jeez. family, my just my situation. Like, yeah, I have things to be grateful for, one thousand percent. Um, I was gonna. When you look at guys like us who have been where we've been, you know, and. To number one, be alive, but also have good people in our lives, good, fa- you know, family, spouses, friends, good jobs. I mean, we got a ton to be grateful for. And like I say, it's it's so easy to to slip the other way and, and not focus on that. So I think 100%. it's just choice, the conscious choice, the thing that I actually try to do that's made a big difference for me. And I learned this actually in prison. I've said a million times on this podcast as a friend of my mother's wrote me and it was you know i was early on i was about three months into my sentence and she just said you know she doesn't know what it would be like to be in prison she's not going to try to even act like she could understand but she said if you'll just you know i was really depressed at the time because i'm finally in a situation that i have no control i'm used to being able to control everything or solve problems this is the first problem i could ever solve and now i'm sitting in there and I got five kids and a wife out there sucking wind because I freaking, you know, lost everything. And and she said, you know, yeah. if, you'll just be, if you'll just focus on three things every night that you have to be grateful for that day, she said, I really believe that will help you out. And, you know, I don't know if she knew how bad I was struggling. I mean, I don't even know if my parents knew, that, you know, from as far as how depressed I was, but 
man, as soon as I started that, everything changed, you know, because you cannot be in those different mm-hmm. emotions when you're focused on gratitude, you know. hundred percent. And that, it sounds, it sounds so stupid, right? It when you hear it. Like, <laughs> yeah. just sit down and think of three great things you're grateful for. Or like, instead of, instead of when you lay down in bed at night, just, you know, thinking about everything in the world. Take five seconds and talk to yourself before you close your eyes. Yeah. Like, that's huge. Um, but one thing you said uh, a minute ago, you said uh, recognizing you have a problem. Uh-huh. Now, that for me was a slippery slope. Because I, and, I, and I, I, I think there's probably other people out there exactly in this situation. and. I recognized I had a problem long before I got, but it was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> I was so wrapped up in that problem. I didn't even know. I know that rehab exists, yeah. right? I'm not, I don't live under a rock, but when you're in that, that moment and you're, even when you're telling yourself, this is a problem as you throw in a handful of pills or, yeah. or whatever your bag is, like you got to know the steps to get out of the problem or, or even like I just told that, that guy that works for us, you know, you have to make the choice for you yeah. to change your life. That's right? I can't, point. if anybody came to me and I, I honestly, I think I made a comment about, Oh, my aunt gets wrapped up in her addiction. Everybody rushes to her aid and she runs off to rehab. Well, she relapses again. Why? Because she hasn't yeah. made that decision for herself. That's right. In fact, she's even gone so far as to call me or tell me that I'm not a, a true addict. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, you can just stay sober. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's, yeah. That's right it's, there. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not hard when you commit to being sober. Like, yeah. It's like everything in life, it's a, it's a fucking choice. Like you make that choice and you stick to that choice. Exactly. And I mean, that's just how it works for me. I understand it's not like that for everybody in the world. Like right. you need a program, go do your program. That's awesome. I'm just saying for me, it was literally a choice. I think like, that's an important point is because I think so often, regardless of what we're dealing with in life, addiction, relationships work just normal stuff it's so easy to believe that there's a certain way things are supposed to be done because that's the norm or the way society right and you have to figure out no matter what the issue is you know what works for you because to me 100 i don't for some reason i think i actually heard it years i mean 15 plus years ago i think it was from tony robbins and i've and I believe what he said resonated with me. And he was talking about addicts and he didn't believe in them saying they were recovering addicts because mm-hmm. we know, and it's even taught it, you know, and AA and everything that relapse is part of recovery. Well, if relapse mm-hmm. is part of recovery and that's what you say, and that's what you believe, then that's what the mind's going to believe. And mm-hmm. when you do face difficult times, you know, it's easy it's hard enough to avoid situations. If you've got the drug, you know, available and you're in a bad space, usually you're in trouble. Um, And then if you're trying to fight against it, but then you have that belief that, Oh, relapse is part of recovery, you know, then basically you're saying it's okay. And then you're really screwed, you know? So again, that's just me. That doesn't have to be everybody. Um, and, and so I really think that's important for people to understand what you said is you have to figure out what does work for you, but it does take that commitment yeah. and you just have to be all in. And unfortunately, nobody can like, like take my aunt, for instance, like my, my grandfather running to her aid and putting in his car and taking her to rehab. Yes. That doesn't mean anything to her. Like, exactly. She, doesn't, she doesn't want to be sober. Yeah. Yeah. Just an so, I mean, maybe they ultimately did me a favor by not doing that thing for me, you know, because yeah. I hadn't made my decision yet where I was done. I, I made that decision when I robbed the same pharmacy more than 
once, but right. <laughs> I, you know, I kind of, I kind of knew the decision I was making when I did it. Like, I, like I, I can't be in this situation anymore. But I had no way. Like, I couldn't even fathom detoxing. And yeah, ended up really not being oh. that bad. But <laughs> probably would have been bad. much better that's in jail. <laughs> yeah, that's that's brutal, but. Well, man, that's that's incredible what you've overcome and you know what you're doing now. It's, that's awesome. It's not to say that I don't get tested, you know. I don't know if you know this, but my wife broke her back. Oh, you're kidding. Just recently. Week. Oh, I didn't know. In that. two places. She fell off her horse and broke her back in Gosh, two places. So she's like, she's gotten in a brace and oh no. She's uh you know, and now she's obviously there's narcotics in my house, right? Right. Yeah. No temptation. None. It's like the strangest feeling I've ever had. In fact, I've actually gotten into her pill, gotten her medication to take. Yeah. And you know, like a few years ago, a thousand percent when I reached in her to pull one yes. pill out, there'd have been yeah. three other pills in my finger. Absolutely. <laughs> but I had like no like that's the first time I was ever faced with it head on where like holy shit, this is like not only here, it's in my hand. Yeah, that's that perfect and, example of the fact that you're healthy, they're in the space, but because you're healthy, you can avoid it, you know? Yeah, it's it was the weirdest feeling I've ever had, actually. Yeah, no doubt. I was like, here you go, <laughs> you know, like, but, Jeez. but, you know, that's, it is what it is. I don't need that stuff in my life. And I know yeah. that now. I even yeah. tried... You know, like in and in with alcohol, when uh, when we first got back together or whatever, we, uh, I remember we're laying in bed one night. She goes, can you go, can you have a drink with me? And I said, well, probably not a good idea. And she's like, oh, come on. You can't just go to dinner and have one drink, right? <laughs> I'm like, fuck it. Game on. Do you want to yeah. see? Let's go. And then sure enough, went to dinner, had one drink, worked out great alcoholic me is like oh you're good babe go have to <laughs> right. go have a drink tomorrow night right yeah. tomorrow night it's not a drink it's a fifth <laughs> yeah you know and it's that fast for me and and i know that and then i know that i literally i had a discussion with my doctor i had a cyst on my hand that i have to get removed uh -huh. and she and i had a discussion that day and this is the first time i've seen her since i was getting adderall and I was like, look, it's probably a good idea that if it's a controlled substance, I just don't need it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, I couldn't have had that conversation with her two years ago. Right. I yeah. never would have had that conversation with her. In fact, I've always kept my wife off of my, like, not able to see my patient records. Yep. <laughs> you know, I've always, like, kept my bases covered where nobody could figure out what I was doing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but now I'm like, through. I've had it. I've added her to my patient records, you know, I'm like taking the steps to hold myself accountable. And that's just kind of another part of staying sober for me. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Well, cool. This is, yeah, that's amazing what you've been through, Chris, and you know, what you're doing now. And obviously you have a ton of responsibility and the fact that you're, like you say, the way you're handling things, but you're also, you know, doing the things to therapy some people i think that's got a big stigma and i think people need to understand that there's nothing wrong about that it doesn't mean you're weak that doesn't mean anything it means what you tell yourself it means <laughs> you know i didn't even i didn't i thought up until two years ago three years ago i didn't think it was okay to go to therapy oh yeah just I like you said point. yeah it, it seems like for weak, weak people yeah yeah I don't know. Yeah, you know complex bury those feelings <laughs> downside you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So no, like that, that's a that was a game changer for me. You know, and, and my boss is actually he goes hey, and it helps him, yeah, that's and that's cool. great. And and he thought, you know, obviously addiction has come up. Like I don't I don't hide my past from anybody. Everybody yeah, that works either. for me, there's nothing like no they know my no, nah, they know my story, they know that's not me. And yep. uh but it's come up between him and I. He's like, you don't go to me. And I was like, no. You know, yeah, he's like, either. why not? And I kind of just told him my story of going to AA when I was a kid. And I, I remember listening to this lady talk about living in a porta potty 
because she couldn't stop drinking. Oh, right. No. I can see the moment. It's That's it's a trip. Insane. And uh I just kind of told him my story with AA and programs, and he's like, he's like, as long as you're in therapy, we're good. And I was like, we don't, yeah, we're good then because that therapy has changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. And therapy can mean a lot of different things. And that's again, people need to figure out what that means to them. If it's a counselor, a therapist, if it's a good friend, whatever. You just have to be able to unload right. things, you know. And it could be your spouse if you have exactly that with your spouse. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be ideal I, I for don't. some people, you know, some people it's not even close to the right situation. Yeah. You just got to figure yeah, out 100%. Works for you. Man, this has been good stuff because I think there's a lot of value here uh, because I think it's so easy to get, you know, I, I, I've always struggled with thinking there's certain ways things are supposed to be done because that's the way I'm conditioned. What you see other people that are, you know, maybe it's, if you're relating when business or success, you know, you see certain people doing things a certain way and they teach that and you think that that's the way it has to be. That is total bullshit. It has to be what works for you, you know? And so. Oh, I, I, this, we had this conversation at my, in my office last night, we were there till like eight o'clock at night. Really? It's kind of a fun little exercise you can do where I, I handed my boss a, a piece of paper and a pen and I said, draw an org chart. Right. Just draw the uh-huh. bubbles on how you view an org chart. And of course, okay. you know, he drew the <laughs> yeah. bubble, the two under it and the under them. And I handed it to the, the director of construction, the production manager. And he said, well, the, you know, I see it the same way. And I grabbed another piece of paper and I drew it upside down. And they were like, <laughs> he couldn't even understand it. Right. And he's like, where does your culture come from? And I said, well, the top of your org chart. And he like got kind of mad at me right. for a second. <laughs> and then this morning he came in and he goes, I see exactly what you were trying to show me last night. Thank you. That's powerful as hell. And yeah. I was like, dude, it, it's just a different way of looking at something. Yeah. I get shit from people because my kids are homeschooled. And in my mind, I'm like, why? Because society says they have to go sit somewhere for seven hours. Yeah, be brainwashed and, and wasting their time with a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> uh, I'm not interested in my kids being worker bees. Like, I don't want them to exactly. go learn how to sit somewhere and do something for eight hours. That does not interest me. And I hope it doesn't interest them. Like, I want them to be free thinkers. I want them Amen. to have a critical thought process. Like, I'm not interested in that program. <laughs> that so, I mean, it, it's it's... And the thing about going against society's norm is it can get uncomfortable and very lonely. Exactly. And especially with addiction, if you don't drink, you're weird. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's I go to bars and stuff and it's super uncomfortable, but I'm the one that's out of place. Yeah. I'm the anomaly in the room. Like, because I don't want to get fucked up with everybody. That's interesting. I'm just, I'm just like, what of it? Yeah, I had a guy on. Uh-huh. I had a guy on uh, my podcast a little while ago. The the episode hasn't released yet, but his name is James Swanwick, and he used to be an ESPN ESPN Sports Center uh, host and journalist, and and you know he talked about exactly that how you know social drinking and it's just it is normal, and for you know you're drinking every night because of these different th- meetings and gatherings, etc. And, you know, he just woke up to the fact that he really wasn't happy and, and he was, so he, you know, he's changed obviously and stopped and he helps people with that, but it was really interesting. He told me some stats and I'm not going to remember them off the top of my head, but the amount of the percentage of people specifically, I think millennials and anyway, and then an overall percentage of the reduction in alcohol intake has blew me away. I hadn't heard of it especially with the last three oh, years, what people have gone through and a decreased, I couldn't believe it. You know, it's kind of like with cigarettes, it was that. so much smoking. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's not that much. I mean, when I grew up, you could smoke on airplanes and, you know, all sorts of places. Yeah. And he's, he, oh, sees, yeah. he sees alcohol kind of heading the same direction, you know, and I, personally, I kind of do too, because I think we're really in a, in a situation in the world where things are going to, there's a paradigm shift taking place. I believe, I hope it, continues oh, yeah. we make it through it uh because i think the best is yet to come um but it's going to be painful it's painful right now for a lot of people um but we've got to get our shit together as a society as a human race you know <laughs> it's really the bottom i line. think we gotta 
I think we should really stop arguing about lines on a piece of paper. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> if we would just we just have to understand that we've been manipulated and lied to to divide us. That's but I mean we that's a whole nother rabbit hole, and that's my other podcast. But uh, um it's yeah, so, yeah. It's so I'm so passionate about because we have just been lied to and manipulated, and it's caused a lot of the damage to to the to all humanity and we're so much more alike yes. we are different you know and mm-hmm. we're the judgment mm-hmm. we have and all the bs you know it's just it's, it's it's a lie and we just have to realize that we could unite and bring more love and unity into this place that we could flip the script overnight you know yeah i mean like you gotta imagine and i, I don't know if you believe in aliens i, I think there probably has got to be something out there right Yep. If they if they're really watching us, they have got to be sitting out there. They got to be going, holy shit, these idiots! <laughs> wrong with these morons? Exactly, <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's <clears throat> fascinating stuff, and you know, like I say, life's tough enough, and that's why a lot of us have turned to things to numb the pain, the discomfort, whatever. And I mean, a lot of my issues, right? social anxieties, obviously, there are other things deeper, but that was one, you know, and. Oh, yeah. It made it real I mean, easy to with... pop a couple of pills and, you know, I could go into any event or situation or gathering and not be uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. Well, we grew up, what, climbing under our desks? To, yeah. Uh, yeah. For bomb drills, like exactly. the desk was going to help, but, you know, yeah. whatever. Like... <laughs> Jeez, that, that's actually, yeah. Cool. yeah, that's pretty sick, funny if you think about that. <laughs> but Well, man, Chris, thanks for your time, man. You been about an hour so appreciate it and and uh you know thanks for being vulnerable and sharing your experience uh hopefully the people are listening that you know they understand it doesn't matter how bad it gets there's always there's always hope but don't and don't be afraid to reach out don't let your ego get in the way and pride stopping you because that's really all that's happening (laughs) you know 100 percent. yeah no that's so true ego is a motherfucker yeah it's a son of a bitch so (laughs) Well, thanks a lot and uh, keep up the great work and, uh, you know, hope tell Amanda, I hope she's doing all right. I didn't know about that, but that's I will. tough. So, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care.